Zalman, how are you? Really exciting today, our very first panel. So run us through who we've got on, got on today. So we're taking a bit of a risk today, um, and I hope it does work out, but we're getting three uh, people on at the same time. We have Shane Quinn from Quintessential, Alton Abrahams from Ash Morgan, and Wayne Lasky from MaxCat. Um, these three men, you know, work in different parts of the market, but effectively run you know, private investment houses. Whether they're lending, developing, refurbishing, repositioning assets, they, they're, between the three of them, they control some very big precincts and properties and have made some very big moves. So it's exciting to get a very wide spread of what's happening across Australia, across each property sector, and also how investment houses like these groups are managing their investors during this period. Yeah, I think that it is interesting. I mean, particularly the cross sector, like talking office, uh, residential, industrial, it's going to be a really interesting take on how they've seen the market and retail. So we can't forget, Don't forget why I'm here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so in the calendar this week, uh, next week we do have uh, another great guest coming on, um, yes. Mark Liebler from yes. Arnold Block Liebler. Have you finished um, the book yet? No, no, I'm halfway through. So I'm getting, yeah. I am getting through. I've been watching too much Netflix and I need to, I need to concentrate. Nerida, and we should wish each other luck on this panel discussion because it could be a big, you know, argument on <laughs> whose market is better and who's whose investment house is bigger, or it could be a pretty productive. They're three very, very specialized and successful individuals and companies that have really shaped certain sectors of the market. So I feel very privileged, um, and I know they're all coming on to hit, you know, to be interviewed by you, and I'm just here for the ride, but I feel very <laughs> privileged that this is happening this week, and it's, it's, we're continuously evolving. Um, if anyone has any suggestions of who they want us to interview or how we can improve our interviews, um, I got some feedback last week that uh, my voice was going in and out, so I got myself a microphone. So we do read the feedback, we do appreciate it, and we are trying to make this as productive and informative as we can. Great, all right, well, I'm looking forward to this and um, I'm looking forward to some really strong opinions. Uh, thank you all for coming on. It's just so great to have you on. We're looking forward to some very, very strong opinions as we know that you all do have strong opinions uh, on the market and also on the various sectors of property. Uh, starting off though around COVID and, and how you guys have been coping through it, uh, so I'd just start, maybe we'll start with you, Alton. So, you know, what, how has your experience working in the industry, working throughout your career prepared you for COVID? Um, look, I, I, I think for us, um, I don't think anybody could be prepared for COVID sort of, uh, you know, emotionally. Um, it's been a pretty sort of, um, you know, ha I guess, surreal experience to, to think that, you know, in um in 2020 the world's been sort of brought to a standstill by a virus i mean there's obviously very smart people who saw this coming i'm not one of them um but i think look certainly the lived experience in sydney is very different to melbourne um on a, or from a day-to-day -day perspective uh, look from a work experience what what sort of um what experience and what, what um, lessons we've learned from previous crises that prepared us for this. I think the GFC from a property perspective um, was much worse than this. Um, we had, that was a debt driven expansion. Um, the retracement of values was, was pretty severe um, and, and reasonably quick when, when it became clear what was going on. Um, we haven't seen that much um, of that yet I, I would stress um, and the lessons we learned from that period was keep your gearing under control um, so we've got average gearing across the portfolio of under 50 percent um, with where interest rates are at the moment that's left us in a pretty strong position so I'd say that probably the biggest lesson from previous crisis was manage your gearing and keep your gearing under control Great. How about you, Shane? You're you're obviously in Melbourne. Uh, you're you're in lockdown at the moment. Um, you know what what lessons have you learnt throughout your career that's really put you in good stead going into this crisis? Yeah, I, I guess going through the GFC and and cycles prior to that, and the thing you've got to continue to do is look outward. And I think in a crisis, people start to look inward 
um, and you can lose opportunity. And, and there is opportunity in crisis, which is, um, you know, it's there to be taken. So as a group, we're continuing to double down on our marketing. We're going harder in terms of communication. Um, and very fortunately, our business has been built internally on culture. So we're doubling down on all of those things. Um, but we, we're probably a little bit different in terms of our thoughts at the moment. We think there'll be a lag in terms of real opportunity being um, coming to the market. Uh, we think everyone's bunkering down at the moment and um, there will be opportunity on the other side of this but when that is i don't know but uh, we're taking all of those learnings and continuing to try and be positive and look outward and, and again that's not a false hope that's not fake hope that's that's uh, the way the business has been set up to, to continue to look forward and um, for that opportunity and i think uh, our team's digging in and, um, and doing a good job yeah, I mean, I agree totally that maintaining confidence is, is such a key issue now, particularly in Melbourne. Wayne, you're also in Melbourne and, and yesterday you mentioned uh, as well that communication was such a key for your for your clients. So, uh, you know, are your learnings quite similar to, to Elton and Shane or, you know, is there something else that sort of has, has come through over the past few months? I mean, I would concur with the other two guys for sure. I mean, I think we started our business in 07, um, obviously had to deal and uh, navigate through the GFC. There was no blueprint for doing so at that time. And I would say um, a lot of similarities, albeit a completely different form of crisis. Um, similarly, no blueprint to navigate through these times. So, you know, having agility and being able to operate with equanimity, which, you know, is what Shane was outlining, which is maintaining that outward perspective and looking for opportunities is precisely what we've been doing too, Nerida. If the three of you could sit down for a meeting with Daniel Andrews, Josh Feidenberg and Scott Morrison, as a collective group with your influence, what would you be telling these three leaders now or asking them? Yeah, I'll jump in there. I just want decisive leadership. Um, I, I, whatever the policies are, decisive leadership, clear leadership is absolutely paramount in um, in crisis, and uh, I'd be looking for that. So that'd be my two bit. Alton, do you think do you think we're getting it, Shane? Do you think we are getting clear leadership? Oh, look, um, I, I I think everyone in Victoria has fatigue, and I'm not going to go there in Victoria. But I think at a federal level, we absolutely are. So I guess you can read into that. I think. Uh, at a Victorian level, um, no, I don't think we've got clear vision um, and it's lacking. Alton? Um, I think it'd probably be a discussion in two parts. One about sort of on the other side of this and now, and I think I, I echo Shane's sentiments about clear leadership and decisive leadership. And, and I think one of the challenges we're, we're facing is the lack of consistency across the country um, the border issues across the country are challenging. The, the, the lack of consistency in approach in, in the virus management, um, I think, is hugely challenging and challenging for business on on a whole bunch of levels, which I don't think have been thought through properly. Um, and there's quite a bit of um, parochialism going on, which is a bit sad to see from from a from, as being an Australian. I never I've never identified myself as a New South Welshman. Um, I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever used that phrase in my life. Um, you know, aside from when it happens to be state of origin time between New South Wales and Queensland. Um, so I've I've sort of been really shocked by um, the parochialism that's taken place across the country. I I, I never expected it in Australia. Um, I think the second part is the old cliche: don't waste a, a good crisis. Um, there'd be three words I'd be talking to the, the um, leaders about is reform, reform, reform. We've been screaming out for reform as a business community for nearly 15 years from tax, IR, planning, immigration. I think the opportunities are massive if the leaders have the courage to take them. It is a shame to have these these border closures. It's such a critical thing for us to, to operate in, in, in a you know much more positive business environment. I mean, my eight-year-old knows the name of every single premier in Australia. Has any kid ever cared about who the premiers were in New South Wales? Probably the health, health ministers as well, I reckon. 
it's amazing how politics has become so important in every every individual, no matter their age. Federally, um, there has been strong leadership, and you know the area of, of federal policy that I'm probably most focused on is our, our foreign policy with China, and um, you know it's a highly debatable point. Yes, you need to stand up for what you believe in. Um, do you need to take the lead globally? in that approach, um, no, I don't believe so. Uh, and we've suffered um, in, in recent times. You know, when you've got headlines like, Australia is like a piece of chewing, chewing gum on the bottom of China's hill, um, that is not a positive situation for Australia, but we are critically important trading um, uh, countries. And, you know, I'm hopeful that the relationship uh, and the retribution phase will pass, the relationship will come on a more even footing, but it is precariously positioned at the moment. Shane, we'll, we might come back to you and just talk about um, our favourite sectors. All of us do have a favourite property sector and, you know, it does adjust over time. So, you know, what's your number one favourite and, and why, you know, what why is your outlook for that sector so positive? Yeah, well, we're predominantly in office and industrial around the country, and we, we, we've loved those sectors, and uh, office is very topical at the moment, so I guess I'll have a crack at that one first. Look, I, I think we will go back to office, and uh, I, I can tell you I'm as dumb as a box of hammers, I need to be around smart people, so uh, the sooner I can get back in the office and, uh, and collaborate with people, I'll be doing that. Um, but I, I think as humans, we will revert to the norm, and... and you know, in crisis, as we tend to forget, I know this is a major crisis and when you're in it, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I do think we will uh, get back into offices. But I think the biggest thing for me is the take up of technology through this period. And, and that adaption of technology is a real threat to office in the future, digitizing jobs. And if you can work remotely and you don't need to be around a team, you know, number one, does the employer need to employ you in that city with a cost base in Sydney that's high opposed to Adelaide, Darwin, India, somewhere. So you can um, outsource that role, but longer term over the next five to 10 years, if that technology is taken up, I see digitization of a lot of jobs and, and that's a threat. And I'm a bit more worried about that down the track. So I've got my eye on that. Um, but after the pandemic, I think we will be back in the office. I think now's the time to be very conservative in terms of your assumptions when entering um, the purchase of an office, be that let up um, incentives, where rents are gonna go. So plenty to, uh, to work on, but I'm still positive in that space for the right assets. And then industrial's the, the darling child, um, as you know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I think industrial's no different um, to office. There's gonna be disruption in that space. I think uh, fully uh, high bay, fully automated warehousing um, could eradicate a lot of those bigger, chunkier sheds, more intensive land use closer to the city and driverless cars down the track. So there's a lot of disruption in the darling child of industrial that I think people are underestimating. And I think what a prime grade shed today is may not be a prime grade shed in um, four or five years time. So people need to be a bit aware of what they're buying and, and the prices they're paying. So. Uh, watch and see on that space. I, I'd be buying land rich industrial more than improvement rich. Yeah, interesting. I mean, you're right, it, is, it has been the darling child. It's been such a shift over the past 10 years into how people are viewing it. Uh, Wayne, how about you? Is, is residential your number one or, you know, what, what's your number one sector at the moment? Yeah, well, it may surprise some, but uh, the residential sector has been performing incredibly strongly through yeah. <laughs> the six or seven months that we've seen. I think you might have seen just very recently CBA have changed or adjusted their um, forecast, pretty material um, revision too, you know, from a 10% um, drop in, in house prices back to 6%. Uh, you know, so we, we have seen very strong performance, resilience in that sector. I, look, from my perspective, we're fundamentally driven and I look at the undersupply of housing. You know, the country has been uh, in the main undersupplied since the Second World War leading into this crisis, I was of the view that in the next two to three years, the big story was going to be Australia's housing crisis. Um, the the uh, undersupply was going to, in our estimations, exceed 200,000. Uh, 
clearly that has abated um, and, and perhaps the crisis is of some benefit in that regard. We saw a material um, pre-crisis pricing downturn. Uh, so that was in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, you know, that has also assisted the sector going into this crisis. So the timing there was good. Um, a lot of conversation around population growth. So clearly on the supply side, that has fallen off the edge of a cliff, new housing starts um, at record lows. Um, but you know, the population story is probably less well understood. We've been growing at about 1.4% per annum for the past 40 years, 1.65% in fact, for the last 15 years, which is the highest growth rate of any Western country in the world by some distance. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there will be uh, a drop in population that will be felt in the short term. But, you know, we also have over 2 million temporary visa holders here in Australia, and more than 50% of the permanent visas come from that pool. So whilst that has dropped from 2.4 million temporary visa holders, that's still a very large pool to draw on. So I don't think the population story is going to be quite as severe in terms of its downturn as others um, out there. Yeah, I hope not. How about, how about you, Elson? What's, what's your favourite sector at the moment? Um, so look, I, we've got a, a reasonably sector diverse portfolio, this retail large format and, and prime and A-grade offers. Um, look, I, I, large format um, has held up remarkably yeah. well through this period. Um, um, I think it's probably been the star performer sort of outside of uh, outside of industrial um, as far as um, you know, occupancy, rent collection, and, and leasing transactions. Um, so that's been really interesting. Obviously, it's driven by a, a, a confluence of factors: work from home, um, you know, the fact that people have got money in their pockets with no nowhere to spend it. Um, so that's been really interesting to watch. Um, um, sort of prime and A grade CBD CBD office is probably our preferred sector. Um, we share some of Shane's views, but but we don't what we don't share is this view that that um, suburban office is going to have this big run and everyone's going to depart from the CBDs and going to want to go and put offices all over the place um, we think the office is a really important part of of the way society functions um, there's there's a statistic running around about I think it's 30 or 40 percent of people meet their spouses in the at work um, you know, if you added that to you know meeting their meeting meeting people at, at sort of after work and and the bars around the city, um, you know, people predicting the doom of the office, I would say to them, be careful what you wish for, um, because that that would see us as a society go down a path which I can't even work out what that would that would mean. Um, so we're we're still looking at prime and A grade CBD office um, in on the eastern seaboard capital cities. Um, we're, we're, we're looking carefully at lease up risk um, and where incentives are going to go over the next few years. But, but we are a big believer that, that um, the CBDs are not dead. Um, they're just having a little rest. How are you going to play with the, um, with the sublease market that's starting to creep into Melbourne and Sydney CBDs that owners are now starting to compete with? Yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of sublease in Melbourne, and I'm hearing tracks of up to over 100,000 um, square metres already. So, yeah, well, well I, I heard one um, comment yesterday of 100,000 metres, and that's going to put a lot of pressure because um, obviously that's just mitigating risk for those tenants uh, and just trying to get any cost they can in the door. So they're really not looking for an economic rent that a landlord would otherwise. They're just trying to mitigate their loss. So that's going to put a lot of pressure around the markets, um, but. Look, there's going to be uh, some things to play out. And as I said, uh, our house view is there's going to be a lag um, before these opportunities or, or, or distress really hits the market. And we probably see it Easter next year um, being um, a time when it's going to play out then. So I think landlords have to get ready. And we're certainly being very aggressive. We, we see that we're not going to do any leases in the next 12 months uh, if we're not super proactive. So we're hitting the market very hard and, and trying to be the first out of the gates. And we've been very successful in Perth. We've done 35% of a building over there um, by, uh, I guess, accepting that the next 12 months is, is pretty dead for us. So we've put that towards incentive. So it's working in our favour. 
quintessential i've invested very heavily in geelong and other outer suburbs where you're building your own office precincts and communities with all this cbds you know people leaving cbds and going into outer suburb offices is that um fueling that strategy to go further or like alton do you think the cbds will come back after this Look, I, I do think the CBDs are going to come back and people want to go back into the CBDs. But if you look at Victoria and, and Melbourne as a city, it doesn't have a second CBD essentially. Um, and so years ago in the GFC, in fact, we went and bought um, a lot of assets in Parramatta. We really seen the benefit of that as a second city to the Sydney CBD. And Sydney has all of these other nodes that Melbourne just doesn't have. So we've seen the opportunity of being in um, Geelong as, as a second city to the Melbourne CBD. That's played out very well for us. And I think it's gonna continue. I, um, if for those of us that live in Melbourne, if you uh, live on the west of the Westgate Bridge, um, to cross the Westgate Bridge is a very uh, trying uh, time in the morning. And that could be anywhere from an hour and a half to um, you know half an hour. So. It, if you head in the other direction to Geelong, it's a very clear run. Lifestyle is easy in Geelong. People want uh, to be close to schools and all of the great things that are in Geelong and for their family and upbringing. So it's one of the fastest growing cities in Victoria and, and precincts. So we're gonna uh, double down on that and continue to grow that out. And we're being, um, uh, I guess, approached by a number of big corporates looking to um, take advantage of having um, alternate space on the other side of the Westgate um, and where the benefit of that um, over time. Yeah. All right, well, that brings us to, to residential, Wayne. So um, one of the things you mentioned was was CBA downgrading their, their forecast, or not downgrading, but reducing their forecast for, for price declines. Uh, I think at one, at one stage they were saying there'd be a 30% drop. Um, one of the things though that we that is supporting the housing market is the fact that the banks are still being very accommodating with people that have, have mortgages and if they do withdraw that support then that could have quite a quite a big impact. I mean what's what's your view on the bank supporting mortgage holders and you know do you think that they can continue to do so through through the crisis? Well um, I think the answer to that question is they have and they will continue to because there is um, an inordinate amount of money coming into the system and um, you know, the federal government has made uh, the job of uh, the four majors in particular, but um, the whole banking sector that much easier to support Australians. Um, and it's important at this point in time. And, you know, look, it's, I think also not lost on the major banks that it's an ideal opportunity to restore their brands yeah. for a post-royal <laughs> commission that we shouldn't lose sight of that. So um, I don't see there being a major change in that respect. Um, personally. How about settlements? I mean, that, that's the other one that everyone has, well, they don't, people don't talk about it so much now, but I mean, are you still seeing high levels of settlement and do you think that will change over, over the next few months? Well, the, the settlement um, stats are quite shocking in a positive way. Um, we were expecting to see far higher defaults. And in actual fact, um, you know, just last month we settled over 1,500 um, if we're talking the residential sector, over 1,500 lots with less than a 3% default rate, uh, you know, which is pretty close to the historical average um, and completely immaterial from a senior debt um, lender's perspective. Um, and, you know, quite comfortable also from, an, from the equities perspective, quite frankly. So that's um, been very positive to see. But what I would say in that respect, is there is a lot of money floating around in the system interest rates are very low and values are typically holding um, presently to the extent that uh, there was a lot of product that came out onto the market with um, and exchanged hands at considerably lower values uh, that would likely be the catalyst to seeing some um, revaluations in place and then of course um, issues with respect to the amount of equity and potentially distress further afield. Yeah, one of the one of the interesting things that we're seeing is a, a very, very sharp uptick in uh, rental listings in Melbourne CBD. So I think it's, they're up about two and a half thousand since the start of the crisis. 
Uh, you know, what do, what do you think will happen to to this, you know, pretty high vacancy rate over, over the next 12 months? I mean, it, it is very dependent on, on foreign students returning and you know, continuation of the, the migration rate. Yeah, it is. And like, I, I think I'm a little less concerned about the immediacy bias of looking at a, a sector in isolation over a 12 month period. I think when we talk about the residential sector, socio-demographics are really important. And therein we're talking about 20 year trends. And that's something, you know, at MaxCap, we're very confident in establishing strategy around. Um, you know, if you're gonna look at a 12 month time horizon, then roll the dice and go and have some fun in the Gold Coast real estate sector or something of that nature, where you have a boom bust market. Um, that's really not the domain of, of Max Cap, nor of, you know, a lot of the more experienced developers that, uh, that we um, partner up with. So um, when I think about it on a broader scale, I, I think the big change there is more so um, the build to rent sector and the effect and the, and the potential change that that has. Because of course, I think Australians have grown up with a, almost a birthright you know, um, which went back to probably the baby boomer generation of having a quarter acre block, right? And ownership, um, even for the Gen Xers, was the only thing that mattered, right? You had to own your own um, house or apartment. Um, I'm seeing a shift now, right, in, in the um, Australian psyche from ownership to um, the rental market. And it's really going to be the catalyst for that, I suspect, will be this build to rent market if it can get it up ahead of steam, which it's clearly struggling with presently. Um, Alton, Ash Morgan's done a fantastic job in basically recreating Docklands District uh, with the introduction of Woolworths, H&M, Uniglo, Hype DC, and many other major retailers and driving that traffic um, with a lot of entertainment there. COVID has probably knocked that center around a little bit. What are some of the ideas of how to bring it back and when? And also, where do you see the retail market resetting itself once Melbourne wakes up? Okay. Um, so I think there's a couple of things going on down in Docklands. Um, so a couple of things that are, that are gonna sort of play in our favor is the amount of development happening around us. And, and we sort of always knew this, this was coming. Um, Docklands Primary School opens in January. Hopefully the kids can go back to school. One would assume that that's gonna happen. That's, there's about 700 kids um, that are gonna, that, that'll arrive there um, first week of February next year. Um, in addition, the Marriott, the first five-star Marriott in the country for I think 20 years opens at a, in a similar time, a little bit earlier than that. There's just a massive amount of development happening around us. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is, is that we really only launched the fresh food component really in March, which was in the middle of the, you know, the first stage of the pandemic. So most of Melbourne isn't even aware of what's happened down there. And so we really haven't had a chance to sort of talk to the market about what's down there. The fact that we've put a roof over most of it, the fact that you've got probably more entertainment there than you do at some other um, centres or even, even at the casino. Um, with the, the cinemas, the ice rink, the, 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 the microbrewery, uh, the, the fun lab group. So I think there's, there's, there's all of that entertainment and F&B piece. And I think the opportunity for us is, is to get some clear air um, post pandemic to, to talk to Melbourne um, about what's there. I think what, what's been interesting for us is, um, is, is we're working with some retailers at the moment who are combining um, some last mile logistics and retail um, down there, given its proximity to the CBD and its co connectivity to the road network, we're seeing certain retailers looking at, 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 at using the space down there to retail out of, but actually fulfill for certain areas. Um, and we've, we've got a couple of tenants that are opening up um, post pandemic and doing that. Um, but look, it's been pleasing over the last, um, over the last few months to see how well the fresh food in spite of all the lockdowns has has performed and and 
you know, we're excited about the future. There's a lot of good stuff down there. And the other thing is that it's an outdoor, indoor, outdoor experience, which, you know, post pandemic may be attractive. Um, as far as retail generally, um, look, there's no doubt retail has its challenges, um, you know, but I think there's, there's some elements of it which are a little bit overdone, um, but some elements um, need to be looked at really closely. And, you know, people are talking about rents and, and coming back. And yeah, in certain sectors, absolutely, the rents have got to come back. But the rents for food court tenants, they're affordable. Most food courts um, pre-pandemic were, were full with waiting lists. And we're talking about the good quality ones. Um, the supermarkets aren't paying too much rent. The, the you know most of the other retailers were the rent levels were appropriate there's there's massive disruption through fashion um and that's really going to play out and there's an excess amount of retail space so is, if retail space can be repurposed um and the retail space in some of these key centers can be reduced i think you know the future is is bright for well located real estate and i think that's the key i think the centers that that are really well located and our, our hubs of activity outside of just the retailing and they bring in mixed use like, you know, residential and office and, 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 you, and maybe potentially last mile logistics, which is happening all over, you know, which is happening in Europe, happening in America, um, that, you know, they'll see a rebirth. There's obviously gonna be properties which are gonna fall by the wayside and it's gonna be very challenging for some owners. The shopping centers um, of just a single standing shopping center, I, from what we're being told, that's not going to happen again. Anyone building a center, they're building it around a hotel, residence, office workers, and parks, and schools, and they're bringing it all together. So mixed use is becoming very much a part of what shopping centers fit into now. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the trends overseas, it's it's all mixed use. Yeah. You know, you've and got to have... Too. You've got to have your hotel, you've got to have office, you've got to have residential, um, you've, you've got to give people a reason to, to shop. People don't have to go out of the house to shop. You've got to give them a reason to go there. So, um, you know, I think it's, listen, it's really going to be very interesting times. There'll be, like, like in other sectors, there'll be a flight to quality. I mean, what we're seeing anecdotally across the market outside of, and, and I stress outside of Melbourne because it's, it's a different experience at the moment, um, is a flight to quality. Gentlemen, just wrapping up now, and thank you very much for coming on. But before we do finish, we just want to quickly go around and ask you, what is the biggest, the one biggest opportunity in the next 12 months? Look, the biggest opportunity we see in the next 12 months is, is um, being able to uh, potentially buy assets that wouldn't have um, come to the market in normal circumstances. I think what what you see in periods like this is is a different kind of decision making taking place by asset owners and be it be it listed or unlisted um, businesses making decisions about restructuring portfolios that that won't, that these that weren't taking place prior to this crisis. So we see the opportunity for us is to get hold of some interesting assets um, through this cycle, um, and that's what we're very attuned to. Wayne. Well, I think if you're talking, it depends what type of side of your portfolio. If we're going to talk about the defensive part of your portfolio, um, cash is trash. You know, um, I don't think the bond market's particularly interesting. And of course, I'm going to talk up real estate debt, but it is an incredibly strong risk adjusted return if we're talking about over the next short period of time. Um, but on the other side, I'm looking at what a lot of smart developers are doing. Um, and it's interesting to me to see quite a few of them um, looking at repositioning assets, but with a very strong ESG focus. Um, and so uh, that's clearly a, a point of differentiation. And clearly that's where a lot of the institutional capital is migrating. Shane? Well, I think uh, for us, we're, we're going to really try and hone and stick to our fundamentals. And again, in a crisis, uh, you have to pivot, but understand your core fundamentals. Ours is about finding and extracting value. I think uh, we really want to hone our skills um, when we're entering an asset and purchasing as to what's our competitive advantage. How are you going to be able to lease that space or, or attract the income into the building and 
opposed to everyone else. It isn't just about buying well, which is going to be tough because the world is awash with liquidity and it continues to be awash with liquidity. So it's going to be looking for a home. So I think as businesses, um, yeah, we're, we're honing our skills back to what it is that we're good at. Having a competitive advantage and, and being aware of what's going to differentiate you in the market and really look for things that are land rich and rather than improvement rich because disruption's coming to all sectors. So if you have great quality land and that you can pivot and that asset to and you've got a competitive advantage to extract value, I think you'll do very, very well. But again, for us, we think there's a bit of a delay. We think Easter next year we'll start to see some real opportunity, but um, time will tell. Thank you, Elton, Wayne and Shane coming on today. It was such a delight to talk to you.